I went to the corner, my friend said, what They said, hey man, you want your share? I turned around and walked away. I didn't want to live nowhere. Street corners with the finest of them. Hey there, Douglas Scott McCarran again. So I've talked a little bit before about this belief that if you quite, if you get the right explanation and understanding, then you'll know. And I think a lot of it has to do with when you're a kid, you know, you're trying to protect yourself. There's, at least in my case, I don't, you know, I don't know, other people may not have had this. I was, well, I felt belittled and despaired a lot as a child. You know, looking back on it now, discovering that I kind of set up the whole rejection thing, how much that's true and how much I caused it, I don't know. But it produced in me this whole, if I structure the story, I get to understand it and then there's a resolution at the end. You know, there's always some drama there's the hero and the anti-hero, and in the end, usually the hero wins. Every once in a while you have a movie where the hero dies, but there's these stages of how you believe it's going to come out. Remarkably like the stories you watch in movies. You know, you set up the, set up the issue, the problem, you see all the ramifications, and then the hero wins or loses in the end. And I've been told there's only like six or seven stories and they just kind of get repeated over and over and over with different characters and different people looking different ways. And that's pretty true if you watch movies. And there's something in us that's just engrossed in watching this. You know, we sit inside these feelings, inside this cocoon, this energy thing, and we watch it and we just kind of, with our popcorn, like, and just get really enthralled by these people that don't exist. You know, Game of Thrones. Did John die or not? No, oh, John didn't die or not. He doesn't exist. But went on for a year. You know, going movies, you know. I'm not saying I'm not susceptible to it. I'll, I'll watch things and get all caught up in it. But one of my... I've actually studied this scene a lot. There used to be a TV program called Castle. And there was this one point where I found myself crying. And I was just shocked because, you know, I write scripts. I know how these stories are written. How the heck are they making me cry? And I watched back, went back and watched it. And, um, for those of you who ever saw it, it's when there's this character named Beckett, who's a police officer, who's been around this guy named Richard Castle, who's supposedly an author in the story, and she's been denying her attraction for it, and he's been trying to get her to notice him, and you know, they have this speech, you know, for four years I've been right here, right here, and you never, you know, notice me. She runs off to go do something else, ignores him, feels like you know, what's the point of dealing with her? She almost gets killed, and then she goes out and sits in this swing set in the rain, thinking about things. And there's just something about the way they did the lighting, and they built it up, and the music and everything. And she finally, you know, shows up at his door, and he's like, you know, what do you want? And she says, you. And she jumps into him and starts kissing him. And I just started bawling my eyes out. You know, you find out later on the two actors are like fighting all the time and she eventually, you know, got fired because the story is becoming more about, I mean, she doesn't actually know. I don't know actually, you know, I just kind of watched it from the outside, but she got fired because the guy who was the lead, supposedly, the story is about this guy named Richard Castle, 
apparently he was giving her a bunch of crap behind the lines. I don't know why, I don't know how true it is. I always found it kind of funny that he thought he was the lead character in the story because it was clearly Beckett. And he didn't seem to understand that that was the story. He was kind of like the major supporting actor, the major thrust in the thing, but the story was really between her and him. And she was actually the, the heart of the show, in my opinion, you know? Excuse me while I scratch my head. But, you know, here we are, here's the story. Two unrequited loves. If only they knew, they finally knew, they have a conflict. It breaks apart, and then they get together. And then the story kind of, you know, people watching the story kind of go downhill. So there's just this, you know, starts losing watchership, I guess you'd call it. Percentage of people watching. Which in the end, that's what the TV show's about. It's not really a story about Beckett and Castle. It's about getting enough eyes on the screen so they can charge advertising. We just get suckered into believing it's about somebody named Castle and Beckett. Two people who don't exist, played by actors who have nothing to do with those characters. And they just kind of play them. And we sit here and get all involved in it. Why is that? People tell me that they know that it's not real. You know, people know Game of Thrones wasn't real. There weren't any dragons. There weren't all this stuff going on. Yet there are a lot of people spending a lot of time discussing it and how it should be and how to rewrite the story and on, as if it was important and real. Well, there's this apparently seven story drama that goes on. There's just variations on it. And I find that very odd. Yeah, I'm looking at me too. Why, why am I getting moved by Stan Akatic sitting on a swing in blue lights with water being poured on her? She's probably not even actually in a rainstorm. She's probably on a soundstage with water coming down on top of her. You know, I mean, Stan Akatic's quite beautiful. I liked looking at her, but that had nothing to do with why I was crying. Um, and I was just really amazed. How did they pull that off, seeing as I'm this cynical screenwriter? But they did. So it intrigues me, because a lot of times what we're doing as movie makers is we aren't really even writing anything new. We're just trying to apply this principle of how to write so we can make a living writing stories, the same stories that people have always told to each other which none of it's real or, or have anything to do with anything, you know? It's kind of like that internal discussion just uses the belief that there's something wrong. We have to understand it. If we understand it, then everything will fit together and everything will come out fine. But that's not true. All that happens is you come together and stay stuck on the story believing something happened. And again, you're not your name, you're not your personality, you're not those feelings. They all flow with or without you. Your thoughts flow with or, you know, try to stop your thoughts, try and stop your emotions. We can get them stopped by repressing, but once you let go of that, they flow again. Whoever you are is not any of this. That's my experience. There's something else living in there. And part of the way the cocoon fools us and ensnares us is believing we have to solve the story it invented within the cocoon. But it has no ending. It has no solution because the design is to keep you stuck in the cocoon, wandering, wandering and wondering what's going on. Eventually, if you want release from the cocoon, you just gotta let go of that whole game. You know, again, in a landmark, you get talked about it and a lot of people come out of it thinking, well, I'm gonna go become a millionaire and a, a ruler but of industry, but you know, that's just more story. I had one per person ask me, didn't I, 
it was a tragedy because I didn't, wasn't going to get to have all that wealth and power. And I'm like, isn't wealth and power just another big story? And then you lose it when you die at the end. You know, it's still just a big story. It's not who you are. It's not whole, perfect, and complete. Anyway, if you're struggling with your inner story, don't look there. You know, a lot of the theology classes I took talked about being selfless. They literally mean with no self, no internal story. And then if you're writing movies, try to write something that isn't the seven stories. That's already been done 10 bazillion times. Try something different. Okay, I hope this was of use. Till next time.